everyone. Um, thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks to the organizers of the Western Hemisphere Symplectic Seminar. And yeah, welcome, welcome to all the participants. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Um, yeah, the talk is titled Sharp Alpsoid Embeddings and Toric Mutations, and uh, it's joint work with Renato Viana. Uh, the paper is on the archive, this is, this is the number. And uh, mostly the pictures we're going to be thinking about are essentially the ones that you see here. So the left hand side will be a four dimensional ellipsoid where uh, the semi axis is going to really be important. So that's quantitative symplectic geometry. And we're going to try to embed that inside some uh, symplectic manifolds, which are going to be essentially toric manifolds. Um, you're more than welcome to stop me at any point for any reason. So please just ask questions, uh, no problem. Okay. So let's, let's get started. So the first thing is to define what do we mean by an ellipsoid, specifically a symplectic ellipsoid. Uh, for that, we just choose two numbers. So these are A and B, these are the numbers here. So they're gonna be the semi-axis of the ellipsoid. And we're gonna assume A is less than B or less equal to B. Uh, we're gonna take R4 with its standard symplectic form. So if you have coordinates x1, y1, x2, y2, that's just dx1 wedge dy1 plus dx2 wedge dy2. And the ellipsoid is just going to be defined by this equation in here. Uh, where you have A and B being the semi-axis. Some people like to put some squares in here. Uh, I'm fine by that. Um, yeah, so it's gonna have volume either A times B or A squared times B squared, depending on how you measure those things. Um, okay, so this is, this is an open domain of R4. It is topologically a ball. And what's interesting is that the symplectic properties of the ellipsoid E, A, B are going to be heavily dependent on A and B if we look at quantitative uh, problems. Overall, the goal of the talk and part of the goal of, of this part of the field is to be given a symplectic domain. You can think of this domain as being maybe another ellipsoid, maybe the product of two disks, uh, maybe CP2 if you really want a closed manifold. And then you're going to fix a symplectic form. In particular, you're going to fix the volume, which you may assume it's finite. And you're going to ask yourself, can I embed a given ellipsoid with a certain A and B inside that symplectic domain? Um, and sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes the answer is no, and sometimes the answer is interesting. Um, OK, so let me now do a very biased review of uh, what I understand from this field. So here's some selection of results that, that I like and, and kind of leads to what we're studying right now. I think this whole story particularly started with uh, Misha Gromov's minus squeezing theorem, this 85 pseudolomorphic curve paper, uh, where she showed that the volume obstruction is actually not the only obstruction. So um, in, in his case, uh, he was looking at the following problem take this ellipsoid in here, where we normalize it such that A is one. And so you have this ellipsoid E1B. And then you ask, can I embed this via symplectic embedding into the following domain? And the domain is going to be a two disk of radius A times R squared. This is squared here. Um, why is this an interesting problem? Well, the target domain, if you look at the volume, uh, has infinite volume, whereas the domain on the source, the ellipsoid has finite volume. So a priori, there's no volume reason for which this ellipsoid would not embed into there. And actually, uh, there, is, there is an embedding which is smooth and, and it's volume preserving from one to the other. Nevertheless, and that's from the squeezing theorem, when you ask for a symplectic embedding, then you realize that there must be a certain condition on the radius of the disk which is to say it should be the smallest of the semi-axis at least. So if, if capital A is more than one, then you're, you're good to go. You can just embed product-wise. Um, but actually the interesting part is that if you did have an embedding, this had to be true. Um, so I don't know, if you read Arnold and company, they talk about the ribs of a camel and whatnot. Um, but you know, this, is, this is the famous the camel cannot squeeze. In, in the eye of the needle. Um, okay, so what then? So in general, the name of the game is take some domain in here, the target domain, fix an ellipsoid and ask, can I do this embedding? Is there any finer obstruction than volume? 
And uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, one of the people that really kicked this off was Susan McDuff, here present in the picture on the left. And in 2008, she started studying uh, ellipsoid embeddings and in particular related that to a problem that uh, Paul Biran had also studied, which is the symplectic uh, packing problem for balls. And, and essentially she, she realized that you can embed an ellipsoid even only if you can embed a certain union of, of balls symplectically. Um, so that was a very interesting way of starting to think about the ellipsoid problem. And at the same time, Larry Guth uh, showed morally that uh, essentially symplectic obstructions, meaning capacities, two-dimensional obstructions, and volume were the only things that you should expect to be obstructions. Maybe in other terms, there's no middle intermediate symplectic capacities of dimensions, say four and six and the like. It's either the top one or the two-dimensional one. Again, just heuristically. Um, so following McDuff's work, uh, then Richard Keen and Olga Butze, Olga Butze, Butze um, proved a, a series of very interesting results as well. And then finally, uh, I, I would say the paper of Dusan McDuff and Felix Schlenk on how to embed ellipsoids inside the unit ball uh, was maybe the landmark result from which then uh, other papers have been written according to because it discovered this phenomenon called infinite staircase, which I'm going to be talking about now in detail. Uh, just to mention some other results, uh, David Frankel and Dorothy Muller then studied the case in which the domain was a polydisc. And uh, I'm, I'm missing some extra people, some of them I, I will mention later. But I, I would say those belong to the constructive part of the theory. Um, but of course, when you're trying to study a symplectic embedding problem, you both have to construct the embedding if, if you really believe it exists. But if you believe it does not exist, so that's the if and only if part of the theorem, uh, you might want to be able to obstruct the embedding. And uh, certainly, Dusan McDuff and Schleng, uh, Felix Schleng did that uh, in the case of the ball. But in general, it, it all stems from the theory of symplectic capacities, uh, initially given by Gromov, and then different symplectic capacities appear, the Echel and Hofer capacity, the Hofer Zender capacity, the Terbo did uh, work on there. And I, I would also recommend that anybody who wants to learn about symplectic embeddings uh, understands the contrast between constructing the symplectic embedding and obstructing it. Um, Felix Schlenk wrote a very nice survey called, uh, I think it's, it's Embedding Problems in Symplectic Geometry, Old and New, uh, Bulletin of the AMS. I strongly recommend reading that that survey, it's very nice. And then uh, I think Hofer, um, I think maybe Chelebeck, Hofer, Lachevs, and Schlenk as well uh, wrote uh, a survey called Quantitative Symplectic Geometry explaining many of the obstructions. So those are good places to, to start learning about this. Um, slightly more modern, Michael Hutchings used his embedded contact homology in order to define the so-called ACA capacities. And they have been really useful in that they're very computable. And uh, to this day, th those are the only ones I know how to actually compute out of the formulas he gives in terms of integral geometry of sort of polygons. Uh, the message out of both the constructions and the obstructions is that there is a very subtle phenomena in dimension four called infinite staircases, which I'm going to talk about right now. The case of the ball again is due to McDuff and Schlenk. The case of the polydisc is to Frankel and Mueller. In the case of the ellipsoid E23, so that ellipsoid is the target. It's not, it's not the source of the map, it's the target of the map. That's more recent and it's due to Dan Christopher Garden and uh, Aaron Kleinman. Okay, so what's, what's this deal with the infinite staircase? So here's a very cool thing that happens, again, due to these people. Uh, the idea is the following, is you fix your symplectic domain, and that's X comma omega, and you ask, does an ellipsoid say you normalize this first semi-axis to be one, so there's an ellipsoid of size one comma a embed into my domain. Of course, if your domain is small enough, uh, if you rescale the form at a very small constant, that doesn't have enough volume to fit this ellipsoid. So you allow yourself to rescale the symplectic form so as to at least beat the volume of structure. And then you ask, and this is this infimum in here, what is the smallest rescaling that I have for which I do admit an embedding of the ellipsoid? 
certainly that smallest scaling is at least given by the volume bound, which is the lower bound on A. Uh, but the interesting thing out of Gromov theorem is that a priori, it might be the case that that A is not just given by the volume bound, but there's some finer simplex construction in there. So the way uh, this is usually analyzed is you define a function C of X of A after a definite length where you look at this infimum and what they discover is the following phenomenon. So I'm going to focus first on the left, but you can also appreciate the same behavior on the right. So what you see on the left are two graphs. The first is the graph of the volume function. So this is A in here. That's the semi-axis of the ellipsoid. This is the graph of the function C of A. And the volume brown is this graph in here. So this is essentially the graph of the square root of A. And this is the least amount of rescaling that you need in order to embed your ellipsoid. If you're below that, if you're trying to embed something in here, the volume is an obstruction and, and there's, there's nothing to say. There's nothing symplectic, purely symplectic to say. So what they discovered is that this function C of A actually has the following behavior. At some points, which I'm now drawing in blue, the function does coincide with the graph of the volume and essentially on the complement of that, the function does not coincide, say at this point or say at this point with the volume. And then there's some special point in here where it, it is farthest as possible from the volume. And so the way you should read this graph is the following, is I start here, I'm having the target to be the, the, the one dimension, the four dimensional radius one ball, which is just the ellipsoid one one. And I ask, can I embed the ellipsoid 1, 1 in the ellipsoid 1, 1? Well, answer yes, the identity. Uh, and that's, that's this point here. And now you, you ask yourself, wait, if I instead ask, can I embed the ellipsoid 1, 2, which would correspond to this one, so that would be E1, 2, inside the ball of the corresponding volume? Well, the answer is no. And that's exactly this phenomenon here, which is saying that the volume bound is not sharp. Instead, there's this whole margin by which you volume theoretically could embed the ellipsoid one too, but symplectically you do have an obstruction. Uh, this kind of behavior is staircase-like. Is staircase so you kind of go up, you go to the right, go up, go to the right, go up, go to the right. And what's pretty cool is that this is actually infinite. So the number of points in which this accumulates, so this kind of point, this kind of point, this kind of point, it's actually an infinite sequence of point that accumulates at a certain point, which depends on the target. In the case of uh, McDavish length, that point was the fourth power of the golden ratio. If you look at this other staircase in here, which is the sprinkle muller staircase, where the target uh, is going to be now a poly disk of radius one one, then the accumulation point is given by uh, the square of the silver ratio. Uh, so that, that's this number in here, sigma is the silver ratio. So that's the quotient of the Pell, the Pell numbers, the ratio of the Pell numbers as they go to infinity. So that's what an infinite staircase is. It's uh, a phenomena by which there's an infinite sequence of points in which you do reach the volume bound, you have a sharp ellipsoid embedding, sharp in the, the bound, the lower bound of the volume is sharp. And then there's, there's a way from it, some symplectic obstruction. Um, it is a perfectly fair question to ask what happens beyond tau to the fourth. Uh, I'm not gonna be talking about this right now, but just to let you know, uh, in this case of tau to the four, for a while, you still have a finite staircase. So there's a bunch of moments in which this keeps happening, but it's finite. And after a while, it just it just coincides. So Cx of A does coincide with the volume uh, for A large enough. So extremely interesting behavior, this infinite staircase at the beginning, then maybe some finite staircase, then the volume bound is all you have. Uh, so that's that's my understanding of what Bruce and Felix did. And, and then on the right, you see what David Frankel and Dorothy Miller did for the case of the politics. Um, the numerics of those staircases, so, which is to say where exactly these points, the sharp points happen, and also where these maximal obstructions happen, 
are extremely interesting. In the left-hand side, it's to do with the Fibonacci sequence. The odd Fibonacci numbers give you these points. And on the right-hand side, it's to do with the Pell sequence. Um, so that's why usually the left-hand side is referred to as the Fibonacci stairs, this, this McDuff and Lane call them. And the right-hand side is usually called the Pell stairs. Um, but, you know, there's not that many sequences out there with names, and eventually you just get staircases with, you know, interesting arithmetic, but we cannot really give them a name. Okay, are there any questions to this point on what we're interested about and what is the infinite staircase phenomena? I'll take uh, five seconds of absolute silence as no. So that's, that's what we've seen so far. Okay, definition, results, the infinite staircase phenomena. Okay, we're gonna move on. So the next is, uh, this is a statement that we're gonna be discussing. Uh, so this is a theorem I proved with Renato Viana. And the goal is to focus on the constructive part of the theory, by which I mean, you're gonna to try to understand how to construct the sharp points of the staircase. So those are the points for which the volume obstruction is achieved. And so there's no obstruction that you could get by symplectic capacity, say. Um, the theorem is about giving some domains for which the infinite staircase phenomena happens in the sense that we can give an infinite sequence, a converging infinite sequence of points for which sharp embeddings do exist. I'll comment on a second that this is actually an infinite staircase. But for now, the constructive theorem that I wanna to discuss today is the following one. If you take either of these 10 symplectic domains in the table of the right, and part of the next five minutes will be about understanding what these guys are, if you take these 10 symplectic domains, then the problem of embedding symplectic ellipsoids into them does exhibit in its solution an infinite staircase, uh, which is to say the function Cx of A does start with an infinite staircase. But we're going to be discussing the sharp ellipsoid points, which is the, the, the point in which the volume equals um, the, the function Cx of A. Um, one of the things uh, to be said here is that a lot of this was, was somewhat known. I mean, the first case, which I'll discuss in a second, it's the case of CP2 minus a line. So that's, that's the four ball that McDevin and Schlenk studied. The second and the third domains have to do with the poly disk. So that belongs to the Muller, um, the Frankel Miller staircase. And then Dan Christopher Garden and Aaron Kleinman, as I said, dealt with the last of these domains in the second row. That's the ellipsoid 2, 3, as, as I will explain. Uh, as far as I understand, the rest of the domains are new, uh, but I, I want to emphasize that this starts with a pattern that, that was known and it just kind of tries to explain it in a different way, which happens to unify them, which might have some value. Um, let me, let me emphasize the two main things that we need to understand to, to prove the way, to prove the theorem the way I, I prove it. Um, the first thing is toric mutations. So all the domains are actually going to be given by toric manifolds where we remove either a configuration of symplectic spheres or a configuration of Lagrangian spheres. Um, but we need to be able to talk about toric manifolds, even almost toric manifolds. So we'll, we'll be delving into that to understand this well. And the second common is that, although it might not appear immediate uh, when you look at the problem, you need to understand uh, certain symplectic curves in these domains. And it really comes handy to have uh, a tropical diagram perspective on those. And uh, certainly Mikhail Hinn has very well understood and explained how to describe holomorphic curves in, in, in algebraic sort of say complex story manifolds, uh, but we're gonna slightly expand his techniques to include symplectic curves in almost story diagrams. So uh, when I start proving the theorem, which I will start doing by CP2 uh, minus the line for the four ball, you'll see why, why that's needed. Okay, so the goal of today is to understand what the theorem says to begin with, and then hopefully everybody will be happy with the proof in the case of CP2, I'll sketch the proof in the case of P1 times P1, and then I think you'll see the pattern of how it goes, and, and you're, you, it's gonna be clear that the ingredients that you need are the ones that we prove. And, and 
Okay, any questions on the theorem right now? Okay, silence will follow. Okay, so a couple of remarks on the theorem. The first one is a mathematical remark, which is, okay, you're telling us that there's an infinite uh, sequence of sharp ellipsoid embeddings. Uh, can you actually tell us what the arithmetic of that sequence is? Can you actually tell us the exact points? And the, act, the answer is actually beautiful. Uh, it's, it's related to the solutions of a Diophantine equation, which is associated to each of those storing domains. In the case of the form ball, uh, that is CP2 minus a line, that Diophantine equation is, is the famous Markov equation here written, alpha square plus beta square plus gamma square is three alpha beta gamma. And uh, a fair question is to say, wait, you, you told us that McDuff and Schlenk came out with odd Fibonacci numbers. Where do they appear in the Markov equation? Well, simple observation, if you set gamma to be one in the Markov equation, then the descent method, uh, so Vieta's descent formula, will give you the odd Fibonacci numbers as those Markov triples that are of the form alpha beta comma one. So that's, that's one explanation of why Fibonacci made a comeback here. If you do write the equation corresponding to P1 times P1, for instance, you're going to see alpha square plus beta square plus two times gamma square equals four times alpha beta gamma. And again, if you set one of the variables to be one, uh, I think alpha needs to be set to one. In this case, you're going to see the, the Pell sequence in there. Uh, in general, the other domains have Diophantine equations. We can, we've written them in the paper. Um, they're kind of well known in, in my rational geometry and, and the theory of mutations, especially coming from wall crossing and mirror symmetry. Uh, but I, I don't necessarily know that they have names. Uh, but we can pin down exactly what those numbers are. Okay, the second comment is it's not mathematical, but it's a, it's a strong suggestion. Uh, the theorem, uh, along with certain theorems on obstructions, is also proven in this preparatory infinite staircase and reflexive polygons by this uh, group of extremely photogenic mathematicians. I don't think Renato and me will ever have a picture so cool like this one. Uh, so this is Alessio Mandini on the left and Anarita Puresh, uh, Dan Christopher Gardner and Tara Holm, who uh, were also thinking about this problem. And they also actually have proven that it's not only an infinite sequence of sharp embeddings, but it's an infinite staircase, which is to say they have computed the ECH capacities and shown that indeed away from that sequence in that interval, you do not have a sharp embedding. So that, that makes the embeddings that we've constructed uh, sort of more meaningful because indeed away from those, you cannot construct a sharp embedding. Uh, we've been talking with them uh, as each of the teams was writing the paper and yeah, I'm, I'm very thankful to them for things we've learned from them and, and how gracious they have been in, in posting the papers at once. Uh, and Arita did talk before me and Dan is talking after me. I, of course, encourage you to go to his talk and hopefully you've got her talk. Okay, um, so let's, let's move on. Um, let's start by the first ingredient. So remember I told you two ingredients, toric geometry and the second ingredient, tropical curves. Uh, hopefully, Toric geometry will be the one that you'll learn very well from this talk and, and the tropical curve, I'll, I'll say a few things at the end. Um, again, please interrupt me. Some of you are experts in the field and some of you have probably never seen a toric manifold, so uh, you should feel free to ask either way. So almost toric geometry, in particular toric geometry, uh, roughly can be seen as describing, in the case of four dimensions, a four-dimensional symplectic manifold as a vibration, surfaces in the fiber, over a two-dimensional domain, say in R2 in our case. Um, this whole thing, as far as I understand, in symplectic geometry was initiated by Margaret Symington, picture of her here, in her exemplary paper, Four Dimensions from Two in Symplectic Topology. Um, she was doing almost story geometry uh, before it was cool. And I strongly recommend, if you're a grad student, you should definitely read that paper. It's extremely well written and, and you'll learn a lot from it. So um, the idea is the following. It's let's consider a base, which we're gonna just take to be an open subdomain of R2. And uh, for reasons that come from uh, the Atelier convexity theorem, uh, we're gonna assume that that's actually a convex polytope. If you're an expert in the field, let's ask it's delta time. So smooth, simple, rational, and the like. 
Um, so what is the picture that you wanna have in mind? The picture is the following, is your four dimensional manifold, it's gonna be a vibration over the base B. So here I've tried to draw uh, what that picture looks in my head. So this is the base B, that's a subset of R2. The base has some boundaries. So this is a piece of the boundary. This is the other piece of the boundary. And then uh, the prescription is the following, is if you find yourself inside of B, then you have a vibration, you have a smooth vibration, and it's actually going to be a vibration whose fibers are T2s. And if you take into account the symplectic structure, you want them to be a Lagrangian T2. Uh, so this is your Lagrangian T2, it's a Lagrangian. There's your Lagrangian T2. And there's a lot of a fine integral geometry going in there due to the arnold uh theorem, mostly because you can take coordinates around the base, use them as Hamiltonians, and that's gonna give you a way to flow in the fiber. Uh, but we're not really gonna be talking about that. Um, again, the most important message is inside, you're gonna have a fiber, which is a Lagrangian T2. Okay, so what happens as you go to the boundary of B? Uh, the rule is that at an edge of the boundary of B, which is not a vertex, you're gonna have just a circle, and that's gonna be an isotropic circle, that's isotropic. And the way you can think about it is that this torus, as it went into the boundary, did collapse. So if you think of the torus as being P2, as being the boundary of a solid torus, you could imagine that degeneration as being, take the boundary of a solid torus and then contract, contract until you get to the core of the solid torus, which is a circle. That's that circle in the boundary. So rule is Lagrangian T2s inside of B, circles in the boundary of B, and then when you have a vertex, which is one circle from this side and another circle from this side, you could think that T2 here has degenerated in, in the two possible ways that it can homologically. So you just get a point. You can also just think that this circle in here did contract to a point. So if you've never seen these, just being smooth topologically, that defines some closed smooth manifold by this, this recipe. And if you want to learn about the symplectic geometry, you just keep track that this is a Lagrangian and these guys are, are isotropic. Okay, so that's the sort of standard toric picture. Uh, there's a small modification that you can make to the toric picture on the left, which is depicted on the right. And the modification is that you allow yourself to have some singularities of the vibration smoothly or just nodal singularities, but it's type smoothly. And essentially I've depicted one such singular fiber in here. So if you see this in here, what has happened is that I was sitting at a point away from this singular fiber and I saw Lagrangian torus. And then as I approach this fiber in here, this singular fiber, one of the curves in the torus goes and contracts. So smoothly, again, this is essentially uh, the same phenomenon as the vanishing cycle. And uh, just keep, keep in mind that the fibers are not simple, they're, they're Lagrangian. But this, this curve in here has contracted to this, this point in here. So that's what's happening. This curve in here, gamma, gets contracted to this point as I, as I move along. The rules are essentially the same as toric. So regular fibers are Lagrangian tori. Singular fibers are allowed to have nodes. Then the boundary is still gonna have circles above it. But now take into account that if I find myself at a vertex in here, then it's not the same as this vertex on the left. So on the left hand side, the vertex necessarily had a point above it. Here, the vertex on the right is gonna have a circle about it, uh, above it. And the reason is that this point in here, this singular point, essentially has now become this singular point. So we've changed the vibration. I need to emphasize the domain, the, the source of the map is still the same, even symplectically, but you've changed the, the Lagrangian vibration, singular Lagrangian vibration, so that that point on the left-hand side has now been part of the inside. And in particular, that circle in here and that circle in here that used to collapse to a point in here no longer collapse to a point and rather have a circle up in here. So that's, that's your crash course in almost geometry. 
message is on the storing manifold allow for a focus focus single or fiber inside focus focus is the usual for these things in dynamical systems okay so we have that uh, any questions uh, yes i'm a bit yes. confused by the picture i'm sorry uh, yes go ahead Paul. Yeah. the in in the in the Tory case when you have two uh, edges that meet uh, the I mean, uh, let's take the uh, take the enabled of a vertex. And how I picture the things in my mind, I might be wrong, but uh, so you have a, a torus in the interior point, then you, if you go to the, the two edges, then it uh, degenerates to two uh, curves, which are not in the same homology class. And then everything goes to a point when you go to the vertex. What happens in the case of the semi when you have, I mean, you have two uh, two circles on the edges that also that go to the same in on the on the vertex, but if they were in different homology classes, I don't see how that can happen. So I, I cannot get a picture in my mind. Yeah, that's 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 correct. So I so maybe for now, let's just assume that this. I'll make some comments on that later. Let's assume this was a smooth toric vertex. Uh, then what's happening in here is that. You do have two homology classes, but um, so let, let me maybe draw it in, in, in yellow. So you can imagine the homology class that was in here, the homology class that came in there, and then you have an extra disk in here. And so what's happening is that you, you may compare both homology classes in the torus, and, and then you're going to have exactly the same picture. So let me maybe draw it like that. The picture of this circle degenerating to this point and the circle over this fiber generating at this point, this picture where you see this cone and this cone, that's geometrically the same as having concatenated this cylinder, this cylinder with this cone and then this cylinder with this cone. Does, does that make sense? Like it's it's still fine for this homology class and this homology class not to be the same, because eventually when you concatenate this cone with this cone, eventually they meet at this point, which is the same way that they met in this point. Does this make sense? Uh, sorry, I I wasn't muted. I I have to think about it. Yes. It's somewhat hard to visualize, but it's okay. Okay, yeah, we can we can talk later uh, if you want after, after the talk. Um, right. So, so there, there's one more question in chat about asking you what the punctured line segment represents. I could the person Vinicius, could you ask it out loud? And if you can't, I we can get clarification. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I'm just. Uh, I just want to understand better what this punctured uh, line segment means exactly. Yes. And are the points above it regular tori? Uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, but um, yeah, so I'll, I was going to talk about this in the next slide, but let's, okay. let's talk about it now. Um, so in, in this vibration, which now has become like a delete picture. So uh, in, in this vibration uh, on the left, as you parallel transfer from any fiber to any fiber, you can parallel transfer. And if you decide to parallel transfer around to yourself, uh, you're going to get uh, an isomorphism. You're going to get the monodromy of the fiber. And that's going to be trivial. And, and one reason is, is this is going to be a flat bundle and this, this bounds it is here. Mm -hmm. Now, what's happening on the right hand side is that by introducing this singular point, you now have created potentially a monodromy phenomenon. So as you walk around this, uh, you will have potentially a monodromy. And when you compute the local model around electric singularity, you do actually get a monodromy, which is a dent twist. Um, so why do we indicate that with this, that, with this dotted dash uh, segment? Um, the reason is, well, it's the same phenomena as when you're trying to do surfaces and you do a branch cover of a surface. What you want to do is to cut the base such that in each of the regions, once you've cut the base, uh, you don't have pi one, and so you don't have to worry about monotony. So a way to think about this dotted line is to say, well, look, just cut over here, 
think of these as being like literally like open it a bit and then there's no monogamy and now you identify the manifold in a way that this right hand side and this left hand side get identified by the monogamy given by the dent twist the cycle along which you're then twisting has to do with the slope of that segment so the short answer is this dashed line is a cut like in the usual smooth topology sense and uh, the fibers above it are smooth Lagrangian tori. And it's just a way for us to remember that as we go along the monodromy of that singular point, you do have non-trivial monodromy. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it wouldn't make sense, uh, for example, to wiggle this line a little bit to have a... No, have a little, it, yeah. it, it, it has is very important that, that this line is straight. Uh -huh. in, but but that's yeah. So I, I I didn't want to go into that. But that's that's a fair point. That that has to do with the integral of fine structure that you're using in here. Uh, the moment you start drawing any line which is not like that, then you would not get a Lagrangian symbol. You would get something which is like I don't I know, half Lagrangian, half symplectic. God knows. Um, but yeah, that's that's the slope of that line. It, it's to do with the integral of fine structure, which again, as I said, it has to do with the coordinates in the base being Hamiltonians for coordinates on the fiber. That, that's the action angle coordinates from classical. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. I think it cool. clarifies. Okay. Okay, let's move on. So, uh, toric picture, almost toric picture, moving forward. So, when we are going to study all our symplectic domains, remember, we want to embed ellipsoid inside symplectic domains, which are almost toric manifolds. It's going to be extremely convenient to understand how to draw the following two surfaces, symplectic two spheres and Lagrangian two spheres. Uh, this is uh, Lagrangian two spheres is what Margaret would call a kind of visible surface. So let's focus first on the toric picture. So that's the left hand side. So on the left hand side, and this is true in any toric manifold, you can topologically do the following. Take an edge of the boundary at the base and you realize that at a vertex of that edge, you get a point. At the other vertex, you get a point. And then as I drew here, I'm just like redrawing what I had drawn. You get circles inside. So that would that would uh, smoothly give you a sphere if you just take the pre-image of that edge under our toric vibration. And the claim is that if you look carefully on the symplectic manifold level, you actually get a symplectic sphere. So that is a symplectic sphere on the left hand side. And a comment is that this is a symplectic sphere with a certain self-intersection, and that self-intersection heavily depends on the slopes of this guy. So I'm, I'm just claiming this gets you a symplectic sphere. I'm not claiming you know how to compute the intersection number unless you study a bit more what these slopes on the right and on the left are. So this will actually give you all sorts of symplectic spheres, zero self-intersection spheres, minus one self-intersection sphere, plus one self-intersection spheres. All of them may happen and, and that's fine. So again, when I see an edge of the polytope where there's no cuts, there's no notes, then above that edge, I think, oh, there's a symplectic two-sphere in there. Great. So that's the toric world. And so in the almost toric world, there's an additional kind of thing that we can see. And the idea, which again, is explained very well in Margaret's paper, um, it's, it's essentially what I think Donaldson used to call like a matching sphere. Uh, and it's the following is above a node, I do have my critical point. Above the other node, I do have the critical point. Suppose that I know that the curve which contracts to this guy and the curve that contracts to this guy coincides. Then I can just concatenate the point, the curve that was a vanishing cycle, a vanishing cycle, a vanishing cycle, down, down, down to the other point, and that smoothly gets you a two sphere. Again, you check the symplectic geometry. That's why it's important that the line is a straight line you get a Lagrangian two-sphere. Uh, the self-intersection in this case is minus two, because it is a Lagrangian sphere, so it's maybe for just T as two. Um, are, we, are we all happy with that? We now get symplectic spheres from the boundary of B, and we get Lagrangian spheres if we have two nodes united by a dash segment, by you know, the usual matching, matching construction. Okay, um, assuming this is all fine. So let's get back to our theorem and the domains in our theorem. So we call it our theorem set, take any of these domains, then there is an infinite sharp sequence of embeddings. 
Okay, so how, do, how should you read these domains? So the, the rules that I have kind of decided to go with uh, in this case is the following, is you take the symplectic toric manifold associated to the closed polygon. So let me just give some names. In this case, the symplectic toric manifold is CP2 with standard Fubinich 2D form. Here, the symplectic manifold is P110 to P1. Monotone, same volume in the first P1 and in the second, because I've drawn a square. Now, interestingly enough, that's maybe not so obvious. This guy is also P110 to P1. Everybody in the second row is just CP2 blown up at three points. And everybody in the fourth row, it's CP2 blown up at four points. So those are the symplectic closed domains that we're going to be thinking about. And the symplectic domains in which we want to embed ellipsoids are going to be given by the complement of certain surfaces in those domains. And the rule is the following. Every time you see a blue edge, then you think about the symplectic sphere above it. And every time you see a red edge, by a red edge, for instance, I mean this guy, or I mean this guy, or I mean this guy, then you think about the Lagrangian sphere above it, according to the construction I just explained. So what is the symplectic domain X omega in which we build stuff? It is the complement of those configurations of Lagrangian spheres and symplectic spheres, according to the pictures, in the corresponding closed toric manifold. Uh, so let's let's do some examples here directly. So first of all, who is this guy? Well, that's CP2. That guy above CP2, that's the standard line. So that's CP1, and it's the linear CP1. It's, it's not a conic. It's really a CP1. And if you take the complement of CP1, the linear CP1, and CP2, you actually just get the four ball. So say your grade is one. So that is the one that uh, Felix Schlang, uh, sorry, Medus McGavin and Felix Schlang were studying. Um, so what about the, the, the second guys in, in the first row? Well, that guy in here is the class of P1 times point. The guy on the other side is the class of point times P1. Notice that these ones have self-intersection zero. And thus the complement of these is just going to be given by the polydisc. So this is the context in which uh, Frankel and Mueller were studying things. Again, same radius in both because I drew a square. Okay, now we get into something more exciting, which is this fellow over here. So, if you just looked at the torus oh, manifold... Roger, well, can you pause for a second? There was a question about, you, you must have made some comments about self-intersection of something being zero. And then uh, yes. Tara has a question about how can it be Lagrangian? Of course, I no, that, that was the symplectic sphere. Oh, it was the symplectic one, okay. So, yeah, my, my, my comment, which we're seeing now here, is that on the left, you get a symplectic sphere, but a priori, you cannot tell what the self-intersection is. You can once you study these, these guys. But, you know, it, what I'm saying is it could be minus one, it could be zero, it could be one, and, and there will be cases in which it is each of those numbers. Um, on the right-hand side, it's always an intersection minus two because it's a Lagrangian. But my comment was strictly about symplectic spheres and the fact that this construction will yield symplectic spheres potentially of different self-intersections. Does that clarify the comment? Whoever asked the question. I assume it does, but. Okay. Well, like, like I think a good example is just what we're seeing here, right? Like this guy in here has self-intersection one. This guy in here has self-intersection zero. Okay, now Paolo is confused. Paolo, do you want to ask what you wanted to ask? Okay. Uh, so I'm sorry, uh, but uh, from the discussion we had above, I what I retained is that you on the, when you have a singularity, you have an S1 on the vertex now, and then that S1 is crashed to the singular point when you, to, to the singular, the singularity in the interior. So that will give me a Lagrange, a thimble over the red arcs that you're drawing, not a, That's correct. Yes. Not a sphere. That's correct, yes. I mean, are you talking about this domain here, the third one, which I haven't still talked about? Yes, I'm talking about that. Yeah, yeah, no, don't wait, wait a second, wait a second. So, so yeah, so let's go to the third domain that, that it is interesting as indeed Paolo is pointing out. Uh, what I want to point out is that um, this, this vertex in here, the vertex that you see in this region, uh, it looks like this. And I did draw two nodes. So um, the way it is drawn is meant to, is meant to be 
uh, this node in here, same code, so a node in here, and then a node in here. And as Paolo is saying, this first guy is just a Lagrangian disk, and this is the Lagrangian sphere. The only thing is that in order to simplify the picture, I've decided to move this node back to the vertex again. So that's what this pentagonal star is doing here. So in this picture, the rule is every time you see a pentagonal star, that's a node. And I'm allowing to bring that node exactly above the vertex. Does, does this make sense? Whoa. Okay. Paolo, does this make sense? Uh, yes. I didn't have the I didn't have the window full screen, so I didn't see the oh. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, yeah. experience. It's like an IMAX talk. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Paolo. This was a very good question. Um, so yeah, let, let's explore that domain a bit more. Um, so what's happening in here is that I have here a symplectic sphere. It's, it's in the class of H1. Um, and the reason is that it closes because there's a node in here. And then up in here, there's a Lagrangian 2 sphere. And that's, that's the, the, the Lagrangian in the anti-diagonal. So the domain that this picture is describing is P1 times P1, where you remove H1 and you remove uh, the anti-diagonal. And this is topologically a ball, but it's quantitatively the ellipsoid E12. So again, we're always going to get the same topology. And here we might even start with the same ambient manifold, P1 times P1. But depending on what I remove, I get quantitatively different domains. Um, I'm, I'm going to speed up a bit if that's okay with everybody and not not do this once but this one is clearly cp2 won't have a three points where you remove four divisors the four in blue and then this is also cp2 won't have a three points when you remove this symplectic sphere and then you remove three lagrangian spheres and you remove them all at once you get something which is topological of all and in this particular case you can actually say what it is quantitatively is the ellipsoid e to three so that's the Christopher Gardner climate case. Okay, let's 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 prove something. Okay, so the way you're going to prove and construct all these infinite uh, sharp embeddings is by the following operation called a mutation, and uh, the operation consists of again keeping the same symplectic manifold. The symplectic four manifold does not change. You only change the way you fiber it over the base. The base might change, but the symplectic four manifold stays the same. I need to emphasize this in like all multicolor. Uh, this is very important. And that's the key thing. We're going to have the same domain, find different vibrations, and in each of those vibrations, ellipsoids are going to be seen, and, and that's how you construct the ellipsoid. So how do you construct these different vibrations starting for, from your given favorite one? Uh, the idea is, is this operation called mutation, which does the following. You start with your base B. So this is B, and you have a cut. So suppose you have one of those cuts in here, which as we explained, what it does is it does, um, so this is this cut in here, and what it does is it introduces monodromy in the vibration. So you do the following combinatorial operation. You go and decide to chop the polygon exactly in half, according to this cut in here, and now you apply a transformation, a GL2Z transformation, only to one of the sides of the cut. So say here we take the bottom side. So you, you, you slice the polygon with a line that contains the cut, and then you take one of the two pieces and you apply a GL2Z transformation with the following rule. The vertex from which the cut was born now has to become a straight line. And essentially, this uniquely determines the GL2Z transformation. And that moves this region over here to this region over here. Um, in order to get the same symplectic manifold, you do need to introduce the cut somewhere else. And in this case, what this happens is that the cut cannot possibly start from here, because that guy is not a vertex of P. Rather, it starts exactly from the other point, where this guy in here is exactly the guy that was in there. Uh, that's what Margaret called transferring the cut. That, that's what the Akhtar codes and um, who else? Galkin and, and Caprici call a, a polytone mutation. A nice example is I drew it here. If you have a triangle, you chop it into two pieces, you take one of the pieces, and then you straighten this vertex that gives this piece over here. Uh, again, the rule is the vertex becomes part of a linear segment. Um, 
that's the operation I'm going to be using constantly right now. And a small comment is that if you have a smooth vertex, you can introduce a cat in there. That's fine. And in general, there's an interesting thing uh, regarding residual singularities and terminal singularities about you know what's left. Is it is it a smooth thing or or not? I don't have time for that, uh, but you can ask me later. Uh, Ivan Ivan Smith and, and Johnny Evans uh, have a nice paper on the wall singularities explaining that well. Okay, let's prove stuff. Okay, so let's prove it in the case of the of the McDuff schlang. So that's that's the ball of radius one, the ellipsoid one one, which we see as CP two minus a line. So the very first thing that you need to know is that an ellipsoid from the toric perspective is just seen as a triangle with a smooth vertex um, such that the affine lengths of the sides are given by A and B. Uh, and the affine length is just the number of integral points uh, that contain that line, possibly minus one. Um, okay, so what do we have? I start with CP2. Okay, everybody loves CP2. And then I see this diagram for CP2 and realize, oh wait, Here's a beautiful radius one ellipsoid. This is the ellipsoid that starts in there and covers it. Now you're gonna complain and say, wait, there's these nodes in here being silly. Well, those nodes can be brought as close as you want to the vertex. So by moving this guy as close as you want to the vertex, you get a volume, a sharp uh, volume filling embedding of the ellipsoid. By volume filling, I mean, given any epsilon, doesn't matter how much uh, how small it is, I get an embedding which is epsilon close to the volume. Okay, so that's a, that's a pretty basic thing. And now you go and mutate. So you mutate, you do that by extending this, this guy in here till it hits the boundary, and you end up with this other polytope. You, you compute the affine lengths, and it's one, one, and four. And so what you're learning is that inside of CP2, there is this other ellipsoid which is exactly E14. And now you iterate the game. Now you take this other guy, you bring it to the other side and you get the new polygon. And in the new polygon, you see something of lengths four and 25. So this is an ellipsoid E425. And you keep iterating that. The numbers that appear as I have written in here are those according to the Markov equation. And it's important that C is set to one because it geometrically comes from the fact that I've never decided. So this vertex is always a smooth vertex. In all these mutations, this vertex is never touched. And, and that corresponds arithmetically taking C equals one. So the lesson from toric mutations is that if I take CP2 and look at this infinite sequence of mutations, I see ellipsoids inside of CP2, which are exactly of the form alpha A, A, A squared plus B squared, sorry. A squared comma B squared, according to the Markov, which as I said, it's just the squares of the odd Fibonacci numbers, you know, two square, five square, 13 square, and the like. And so now you've succeeded in embedding the Fibonacci sequence, not into the ball, but into CP2. Okay, good. So that's, that's the first lesson. You have it in CP2. Now comes the hard work. Well, I mean, this was like a, a good idea, but you still have to do something. And what you need to do is exactly this comment in here. You need to find a line in CP2. So I do not want to say that CP2 has an infinite staircase. I want to say that the four ball has it. So for that, I need to argue that every ellipsoid that I find actually lies on the complement of a line. And actually that line was symplectically isotopic to my initial line so that I can talk about the same domain all the time. So Here's an example of E11 inside of CP2. And I can say, well, it's far away from this line at, at the, the node if you want. So that's the four ball. So we see E11 inside of the four ball. Now you take E14 and you say, wait, here, I don't know what I have. If I could claim that here there is a symplectic line and I could claim that the complement of this symplectic line is the same as the complement of this symplectic line in the first one, then I would be done. Same for the third, same for the fourth, same from the fifth. If I'm trying to build an ellipsoid and I can claim that it's done in a dense way away from a region where I have my line and I can show that the complement of that line is the same, then I'm done. And that's, that's where the symplectic tropical curves come in. So, Here's the game. The game is, well, believe me, or read the paper or ask me later. There's a theorem that says you can draw something like a tropical curve, a la Mikhailkin, with small modifications. 
such that you can claim that above that tropical diagram, there is a symplectic configuration as you want it. So let's use this in an example, so that's very clear. So I have my ellipsoid, remember, my ellipsoid started here, and I wanted to claim that it lied in the complement of a line. How do I see the line? Well, had I not have these nodes in here and the cuts, the line would just be this straight segment. But now that we have these nodes, we need to come up with a different way to talk about the line. And that's exactly what this tropical diagram in here is doing for you. There's, again, the theorem is every time that you see any such thing with legs, that does represent a symplectic curve. And our theorem is you can do an embedded symplectic curve and you can put it in the right homology class and you can intersect it as you want with the Lagrangian spheres. So this is the line in CP2. Note that it intersects three times uh, the, the hyperplane section, the toric divisor. So that's, that three had to be there. And part of the new things that we're doing, essentially the hardest thing that we're doing regarding tropical curves, is explaining what does the tropical curve mean when you go into a node. So again, Mikhail Hing had explained to us how to understand all of that had not been any nodes. And the question is, how do you deal with nodes? Um, suppose for a second that this theorem is true. Here's the proof of the mcduff schlang theorem. Well, you start in CP2, you see this E11, you detect this line in here, and you say, well, that's the standard line. It can be isotoped to this edge in here. So that's the four balls. I have E11 embedded inside of the four balls. Now you mutate, and you have the ellipsoid E14, which starts here. Now, theorem, you can draw this diagram in here, this little tropical curve diagram, which claim yields a P1 which is linear, it's in the homology class of the standard line. So now you know that you've embedded E14 inside of CP2 away and, and sharp embedding in the sense that you can do this as volume filling as you want, away from this linear P1. You're still not done because the complement of this linear P1 might not be the same as the complement of this linear P1. Uh, so you have to prove that. And you do prove that. And in this case, it's rather easy. You just go back to Gromov 85 and you learn that the symplectic lines in the same homology class as the line are unique. So the symplectic isotopy problems for line in P2 has a unique solution. And then you're done. Same here, you construct the line and then it's symplectically isotopic to this line and hence symplectically isotopic to this line. Same for this one, same for this one. Ah, so in the last two minutes, uh, let me explain what happens in the general case, because things get uh, real funky, but it's a lot of fun. So the general case has two phenomena that CP2 does not have. The first thing is you do encounter Lagrangian spheres. So this is a Lagrangian sphere. This is two Lagrangian spheres. So in general, you need to, to be able to claim the same thing about the complement being the same, where now you also have Lagrangian two spheres. And also in the symplectic case, you're going to have configurations of symplectic two spheres, not just one two sphere. So here you see a plumbing of two S2s, two symplectic S2s, and then you're going to have also the Lagrangian sphere. So in general, you do need to prove uniqueness of the symplectic isotopy class and the Lagrangian isotopy class of configurations of symplectic spheres and Lagrangian spheres. That is, uh, in general, extremely hard. But luckily, in the case of P2, P1 times P1, and the blow up of P2 up to a certain number, uh, a lot of good work was done uh, by, by McDuff herself, and then Richard Hint explained how to do it in P1 times P1, and Wei Wei Wu and Tian Chun Li did it in blow ups of P2. Johnny Evans also has good results in Lagrangian spheres in those blow ups. So essentially, the message is you then br borrow from the literature and, and conclude that those isotopy problems can be solved. I'll do the case of P1 times P1 in my last minute. Note that in both cases, you need to argue that there's the right tropical curve. Uh, so essentially, uh, getting to the last slide. So how do you do D2 times D2, the frankel muller case, and, and E12, which they also did. Um, so in here, you need to understand uh, the symplectic isotopy class of H1 and H2, this union with this node in here. There's always two steps find the right tropical diagram and argue that that tropical diagram is embedded. It gives you an embedded symplectic curve for each component with the right singularities. And I agree with you that this was like very pretty and beautiful in the case of CP2, uh, but things get real serious already in the case of P1 times P1. Uh, this picture that it's in here, that represents H1 and H2 in P1 times P1. 
So in general, you do have more and more complicated diagrams as you keep mutating. Uh, the uniqueness of those configurations is, is readily deduced from the uniqueness of aligning in CP2 by blowing up once and then blowing up uh, down, uh, blowing down twice. So again, a problem that we can solve. Uh, same in here, except that now in the case of E12, you have a Lagrangian sphere and then you have a symplectic curve, H1. You need to argue that this H1 is, is unique. That, that follows rather immediately from Gromov. But then you need to argue that this Lagrangian sphere is unique, and that's what Richard King uh, tends to tell you. Um, again, in both cases, you keep mutating and you follow a sequence, which in this case recovers the Bell staircase. Um, I'm going to forward immediately to the end of the talk, skipping the last two uh, slides. The last two slides are, were just meant to explain how you construct these tropical diagrams. You can ask me later uh, the messages inside you just use the Hawking's model and outside you get very creative and, and that's our paper. So our new contribution to the tropical curve is what do you do around a node, especially if you write with multiplicity. That's a very simple picture. Uh, that's a more realistic picture. Um, when you look at these three manifold, those are gonna be length spaces. And then you're trying to construct a certain symplectic filling of a transverse link in that compact manifold. And well, then you, you go and argue that you can do that. And, and that's the way you get a model of the symplectic curve that you want from that tropical diagram on the base, which interacts with the node. Um, so here are two questions that you can ask me, uh, which is what do you do next? Fine, you, you've proven this result about uh, the infinite staircases, the sharp parts of them, and, and some new domains, so great. So what do you do now? Well, ask me later. <laughs> One thing is different uses in, in four dimensions, and another thing is, well, we do know how to mutate in higher dimensions combinatorially. Can we translate that into some interesting infinite staircase for say dimension six? Um, Susan McDowell, Felix Lang, Dan Christopher Garden and, and company have, have been studying this ghost staircase, some, some pretty cool phenomena in 6D as well. Can we say something of that sort uh, in high D? And, and that's the end. I'm sorry it was a minute late, uh, but thanks a lot. You can ask any questions now. Thank you very much. Um, let's thank Orte. I don't think you have to apologize for running over. You did take quite a few questions. Um, anybody else have more questions? There were a couple of questions um, towards the end of the talk that uh, were asked in chat. Uh, mm -hmm. does, uh, the, sorry. Um, Augustine, uh, did, did you want to ask your question? Uh, sure. Uh, hi, Roger. So thanks for the nice uh, talk. Um, no, I was just, just wondering, um, because you seem to be removing those spheres in order to get the manifold that you're actually embedding things into. And I was wondering if it's related to like classical sort of correspondence between polytopes and fans or something like that. Um. I'm not sure what, what the question exactly is. Maybe you can ask me again after I give an, an, a tentative answer. Um, so in the polytope world, it, it's relatively easy to see symplectic P1s, and especially once you start blowing up, that's also easy. In the fan, uh, I think it's a bit more challenging to, be those, to, to see those P1s. It's, it's probably possible. Something I do not know is uh, how to see Lagrangian spheres in in the fan. Uh, if you know about that, I, I'd like to learn that. Uh, but it, it is really fundamental. Maybe I not. Sort of, yeah, I, I can ahead. try to answer Augustine on this, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, so naively th think about the fan that's dual to these pictures that is drawn there. What you're going to have is that uh, the, the fan gives you an orbifold with some orbifold singularity. And uh, in these particular cases, these orbifold singularities are going to be uh, AM type singularities. So what I want to do, like think about the toric orbifold that's naively given by the fan of these guys, and then you want to smooth it. You are essentially smoothing these AM type singularities. And that's why you're going to start seeing these Lagrangian spheres that comes out of the smoothing of the AM type singularities. That's kind of like one way to relate this with a fan. I'm not sure if it answers your question. Yeah, okay, thanks. I mean, I, I need to think about it, but that's more or less 
the idea, I guess. Yeah, a, a short comment, kind of building on Renata's uh, comment. Um, if this had been the, the Western Hemisphere algebraic geometry seminar, um, all of these, and that's actually the way I thought about this first, all of these can be thought as weighted projective spaces uh, that admit a Gorenstein smoothing into P2. And that smoothing, which is what Renato is talking about, is what produces the Lagrangian spheres. And, and th those are naturally the closed toric manifolds that you obtain when you mutate. You get weighted projective spaces. You start with P2 says. Um, so if you're more familiar with that picture, it's really that picture, except that you're smoothing every weighted projective space so as to get back to your smooth initial domain and then removing those Lagrangians that allow you to smooth things. Any other questions? Okay, can anyone else ask? I have a question about, um, so in the, in the literature on mirror symmetry, there is this important distinction uh, about the existence of two different affine structures on the base of Calabiaus. And so one of them allows you to describe Lagrangians tropically and the other one allows you to describe holomorphic curves tropically. But somehow here you only have one and you use it both to describe Lagrangians and to describe, well, I mean, you don't describe holomorphic curves, you describe symplectic submanifolds. So are you able to get, I mean, my, real, my, my expectation is you can get away with it because you're trying to do symplectic submanifolds, but my real question is, do you expect this also works in higher dimension or does this only work in dimension four because you're using some kind of rigidity statement? Um, I think the short answer is yes. I think dimension four is very much needed for this kind of argument. And I, I should add, it's very important that, as you said, we're using symplectic surfaces and not allomorphic surfaces. Uh, all the models that we're using are symplectic. We did try some allomorphic arguments and, and they just don't get you the right intersections. Uh, so, so indeed, the fact that we have the liberty of being symplectic, not just allomorphic, is something really used. And in higher dimensions, uh, a basic question is to ask, what is the vanishing cycle of something, even if you try to smooth singularity? So I would maybe expect that, say, in 6D, you're going to have P2s, which are maybe the faces of, of that uh, two-dimensional polytope now, uh, well, three-dimensional, you can consider it. And those P2s are going to intersect in a P1 in a, in a normal way, and that part is going to be fine. And then the challenge is, how do you now understand Lagrangians? And I think things as you say, will get more complicated. First of all, topologically, because now the, the, the symbols are not going to be uh, disks. Now we're going to be like P2s and cones over P2s and whatnot. Uh, but also, as you say, there's going to be an issue with the affine structure. And I, I really do not understand the six dimensional case yet. It's uh, one of the things I like. But the short answer to your question is yes, I think it's very important that we use four dimensions for this exact kind of construction. And it is very important that we use symplectic surfaces, not to go more surfaces. So I, I agree with both those comments. Thank you.